Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, more specifically, about the things that are going on in the healthcare industry, the things that you guys are probably involved with, and my feelings about them as an economist. Um, and in general, I hate all of it. Um, but I'm going to give you reasons why, and I'm going to give you facts and data and perspective that hopefully will temper and shape kind of your worldview as you go out there and consume. I was struck by, you know, I, <coughs> Jim and I are, are good friends, and we, we teach together for half the year uh, with some of our MBA students who are here in the back, um, and, and he and I are uh, a little bit different in our orientation. We agree on a lot of things. I was struck by the fact that, you know, Jim was pretty clear in the statement that uh, a lot of health care, maybe even the plurality of health care is unnecessary. I agree with that. Um, that we've got a huge fiscal train wreck. I agree with that. That politics aren't likely to change and structurally enable us to address it. I agree with that. So I just don't know how logically you can go from those three kind of precursors to, well, we've got to expand an entitlement program. I mean, that's just where I have this logical disconnect. And so we agree on 75%, but that last 25% is kind of key, and, and that's where we don't see eye to eye. Um, I was also struck by the fact that Jim made the point that, you know, politicians are influenced by their constituency, and unfortunately the constituents are ill-informed, and that kind of shapes our world. I think there's an interesting parallel to your all world, because you have constituents, they're providers, and unfortunately, I would argue the plurality of providers are largely ignorant as well. And they want to buy something from you all that I would prefer that you didn't give them. <laughs> and because I don't believe in the long run it's going to serve our industry particularly well over the longer haul. And I'm going to lay out what the, we have in terms of evidence and perspective on that. So I've got a bunch of slides here. Um, don't care if we get to any of them. Don't know that we'll get to all of them, because I always have more slides than I have time. You're welcome to have copies of my slides. Most of my, any good slides I have, I stole anyways. <laughs> um, and so all you have to do is just uh, give me a card, send me an email, whatnot. I'll be glad to send them to you. So here's what the agenda is. I'll go, do a little bit on my framing of the economic mess, the math problem. More importantly, I'm an economist, and economists are focused on what the equilibrium looks like when everything shakes out. And I want to paint a picture for where, when, this, when, when all the dust settles, what that looks like. And, and I really think that's what we should be focused on, is what the, when the dust settles, what, the, what things look like. Um, and this is very different than what the industry is focused on. And I want to go through evidence from CMS demonstration projects, GAO, various sources, so being a, as apolitical, uh, and this is possible, to frame kind of the current focus on a lot of the initiatives that are going on in the industry, say what we, should we be focused on and what my crystal ball s suggests. So that's where I'm going. Now, um, <laughs> we're recording this, damn it. Um, <coughs> it's, it's particularly bad for Luke and I. Um, so the views and opinions and truth expressed herein are those of my, those reflect my Truths and, and, and it will, if it's a truth, period, but my views only, and clearly not those of my employer, all right? So this is in no, nothing I say is in any way, shape, or form endorsed by Vanderbilt University, nor the logically and mathematically challenged. Um, and I am going to be focused on kind of the equilibrium. The, the timing of this, not as clear on. We're not real good on that. But I, I do believe that economics has a lot to say about where we end up. So a little preamble, because you, know, you knew who Jim was and what his preferences were, given, given the, uh, the plurality and, and the huge amount of information out there about J Jim. But um, you know, things I like here, I love cholesterol and beer. Things I dislike, uh, crowd cities waiting, answering in the phone, excuse me, imprecise thinking and budget deficits. And while in healthcare we love talking about access and quality, I really don't give a damn. I don't. Um, and furthermore, I can prove to you how it is uh, a really misguided conversation. And, and I'm going to show you some evidence to that effect. To me, the cost side is just about everything. And so here's a picture of Jim and I in, in the Capitol building with all those uh, heads. And th there's Reagan, and there's Jim, and then there's me. And, and I'm kind of on his right side, and Jim's on his left. See, isn't that cute? All right. 
So I, I kind of telegraphed this a little bit, but I, I think it's useful to, to, to step back and take a big picture view of the world here and put this in context. Because just over the course of my lifetime, the world has come unglued. And, and, and so just a 45-year perspective. When I think back to when I was a kid and, and, and having conversations with my parents, um, they paid for stuff for me out of pocket. We paid for the pediatrician out of pocket. In fact, they say they paid for my delivery in the hospital out of pocket. There wasn't coverage for that. We had something called major medical, which, reduced, which kind of covered the old 80-20 co-insurance world, and that was the nature of what insurance was. And actually, that's what insurance is. The, the biggest challenge we have in America is Americans don't understand insurance. Insurance is really a, a wonderful concept. It's there for high consequence, low probability events, and that's it. Those are the only things that are insurable. And we have completely lost context of what is insurance. Catastrophic insurance is the only thing that makes sense. And everything else has been a, a, a slippery slope that we've, in, we've kind of uh, been led down over the last 30 years, in part pushed by the HMO movement, that has really gotten us to a point now where I just don't know how you kind of put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak, you know, because that's where we are. Um, elderly live with their families. I mean, everybody had kind of a crazy aunt or uncle living in the attic type of thing, right? I mean, you had elderly family members, and they were your primary responsibility population we were thinner and we took fewer prescription drugs. Now scroll forward about, uh, to about 25 years ago and um, we had uh, this HMO movement. Now that's actually me uh, be, uh, 25 years ago and I had mad game and that's my better half, my wife, and uh, before I started worrying about health care and, and started breeding and throwing lots of kids on the pavement because we need future taxpayers. Um, but we had this growing health care cost inflation problem and the 80s into the 90s brought forward this idea of health maintenance organizations, which I view as kind of the first nail in our coffin. Because that fundamentally disconnected people from the price of the services they were consuming. Now, health maintenance organization, man, it sounds so much like patient-centered medical home and all kinds of stuff we hear today. But man, if we can just get people healthy, it'll all be fine. And, and if we make it real cheap for them to go to the doctor, man, Magic will happen. Well, I can show you in every piece of data I can find that this just upset the apple cart. Low cost sharing and co-pays, comprehensive health benefits that, that violated fundamental economics all came, a, a, a par, came around as a part of this. And then we had the acknowledgement that health care costs were a problem for individuals and companies. And then we roll forward to today. Now, I have four kids, and I spend less to take those kids to a pediatrician a day than my parents did 40 years ago. Right? And I make serially bad decisions as a result. There's this thing, the Pediatric Employment Act is the well-child visit, right? <laughs> I mean, it is just ridiculous. We're in a business school. We teach in a business school. The essence of value creation is to take and convert some inputs into an output that somebody out there would want to ha place as a higher value on, such that you can engage in exchange and both parties are better off, right? Okay. That's the essence of how you create value. Now, I am just about indifferent between spending $20 on a copay for one of my, a well child visit for one of my kids. I'm just about indifferent. But that is actually a $267 reimbursed uh, amount to Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And if you ask me if I'd be willing to take $267 out of my wallet and put it on the table, the answer isn't no. The answer is hell no. <laughs> Ain't no chance. And hell, I'd be willing to do that. So I am destroying value through that consumption. And that's what we do throughout the US healthcare system. Um, my grandmother lives in a nursing home in a state uh, far away. And, and, and it is a re state responsibility rather than my family's responsibility. We've basically changed kind of the social contract around whose obligation it is to care for our seniors. The Medicaid skilled nursing facility benefit is one of, the, is one of our biggest parts of Medicaid expenditures. And then I've historically been a balding middle-aged fat man with a BMI of about 30, and I did take six prescription drugs a day. That was until April when, for my wife's birthday, she uh, requested that I get a personal trainer. Because um, she physically moved out of our bedroom because of my snoring and sleep apnea. So to get her to come back, 
I had to engage in an activity that I hate, which is working out. And I've been doing it every day, every week since April, and I've lost 20 pounds, and my body fat dropped from 23.7 down to 15.9 percent, and I still hate it every single time I go, and I curse her every, every week. Um, but, uh, so I, I, I don't have that BMI anymore, and uh, so I used to be a much better kind of visualization of middle America when I was big and a lot fatter. Um, but this is the world, just in this period of time, it's amazing how in my lifetime we've gone from this role where we, had, we were individually responsible, fiscally accountable, to one where now everybody believes that it's somebody else's responsibility to pay for stuff. And we don't have the money anymore. Now, this is the way I frame our big picture problem. And I think it kind of hammers at home. So consider a, a household, the Jones family, four ki uh, two adults, two kids, with a household income of $22,000 a year and expenses of $36,000 a year. That's just kind of right about, about the poverty line in the United States. So they're generating this annual shortfall, and they've got a credit card balance of $160,000. Are these guys screwed? Totally. And, and wait, and, uh, not surprising, they haven't saved a lick for retirement, right? And they need about $540,000 to cover their, post, their retirement, um, uh, their, to afford them the ability to retire. So is this something that you can change quickly? Uh-uh. No way. If all I have to do is multiply that by 100 million, and that is the framing of our federal budget. That's how bad off we are. And so that gives us this. Now, this is a slide that I always use when I'm fighting with Jim that I just love. <laughs> because he loves to place political labels on things, so we can place a lot of political labels on things. The, but there's a number of key points. This is, the, the, the red line is spending as a percent of the economy, okay? And the green line is revenue as percent of the economy. So that's our tax receipts. And I stole this from USA Today. Uh, a number of years ago, um, but over this period of time, we have had incredibly high marginal in, in, in personal income tax rates and high corporate tax rates, and we've had low periods, right? We've had Democratic presidents and Democratic Congresses and Republican Dem uh, presidents and Congresses. We've had 70-something we've had years of experience here. Okay, regardless of what you do, you can't get more than 20% through our tax system into the federal coffers. I mean, there's a tremendous regularity here. You touch it there just a bit, but you can't get more than 20% in to the government through taxation. So, just pretty simply, solving the math problem, you can't spend more than 20%. And you can't tax, raise taxes, and have that translate into higher government revenue that you can expend on your social programs or defense or whatever you want, because it just doesn't work that way. People get creative. States find that when they raise taxes, what do people do? They move. <laughs> and similarly, people can leave the, leave the country. So we can't get credibly more than 20%. So this is just a, uh, a graph to me that makes that point. And so you can't be spending more than 20%. Now, you know, there's some uh, allusion to the uh, tax Mageddon, the, the sequestration cuts that kick in on January 1st. Here is kind of the CBO's picture from June 5th of what that looks like. Um, and, and, you know, you see here revenues, if they let everything kick in, the SGR kick in, the sequestration cuts kick in, you whacked, you whacked everything that... Revenues kind of exceed non-interest spending, which I think is a com complete sleight of hand because I don't know anybody here who has a loan that they can afford not to spend interest on, and the interest costs are actually significant, and they're growing, okay? But if we do something like we uh, kick the can and we, s we don't enact the SGR, you know, you've got this non-interest spending, and the interest spending is even higher, that greatly exceeds our ability to pull in revenues as far as the eye can see. So this can't happen. And Jim showed this slide earlier. And at the same time, uh, we have fewer, fewer people. Uh, we have 
more and more people who are relying on the government redistribution of wealth as a, as a source of household income. So this is entitlements as a share of household income are up to around 18%. So one out of every $5 of household income is the result of a government transfer payment. But that's against a backdrop of having uh, nearly half of Americans not paying income taxes to start with. So in combination, all these things create a pretty dismal picture, right? I ran these numbers. If you look at the share of national health care expenditures that people are paying out of pocket, it's never been lower. This is uh, going back to kind of the time frame when I was talking about when I was a kid. Almost 50% of health care expenditures were paid out of pocket between the provider and the individual. Now we're down to around 12, 13 percent. And, and while Medicare is no question our biggest challenge, Medicaid is as well, and the federal portion of Medicaid has been, kind of mon uh, has been going up pretty significantly over the last few years, up to around 67 percent of all Medicaid expenditures are, uh, are two-thirds are funded by the feds. Um, if we put a finer point on the trustees report, which, does anybody here read the Me Medicare trustees report? Yeah, just once a year. Because it's awesome. It's a good read. And there's this guy, Richard Foster, who is the chief actuary for CMS, who I, I, I kind of have a man crush on. Because this guy comes really strong with, with truth. So every year they put out the trustees report and then Richard Foster and the actuaries step over here and say, um, it's kind of like an audit opinion. We completely disavow any association with this trustee's report, and we direct you to do the alternative scenario. <laughs> it's really cool. And so, uh, so you can read Richard Foster's alternative scenarios that he puts out every year to basically say CMS trustees are completely playing games. Okay? Um, so this is a summarization of the, 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 the trustees report from this past year. Um, and so what is our shortfall uh, on Medicare? It's around $285 billion. Um, and they've been issuing this warning for seven straight years. The cumulative cash fall on Medicare since it was created in 1965, um, well, uh, is about $3 trillion. Um, Medicare between, since 2001, a th almost a third of our debt, national debt, is due to Medicare alone. All right? Now, th these numbers I think are actually a little bit more fun. So to, to balance, because I really am fundamentally concerned about the math, e math problem. I don't care how you do it. Just solve the math problem because I love my kids. All right? Um, so on, the pay on Part A, to balance Part A, you need a 31 uh, percent uh, uh, payroll tax increase, moving it from 1.45 to 1.9. That doesn't seem that big a deal to solve Part A, right? A 31, uh, that's 31 percent. So that's not that big a deal. But here, here's, here's where it bites. Um, to make Part B balance, um, you need to increase the premiums because the typical seniors kind of don't pay that much. They pay uh, about $1,200 a year for Part B premiums. You need to move it to almost $4,500 to get the outflow to match the inflow. All right. So increase that $3,500 on every senior. And then on prescription drugs, the average senior spends about 30, 35 bucks on Part D premiums monthly, and that would have to go up tenfold, almost tenfold, to get that part to balance. So this is completely out of whack here. Um, and structurally, this is a huge problem for our industry because, well, at least 50 percent or more of our industry's finances are tied up in the government, and it's growing. Um, we aren't funding our healthcare consumption with contemporaneous revenues. We're borrowing, and now we've got these, these baby boomers coming in, and they want to live and consume. And so you put those three things together, and it generates sadness. <laughs> There's just no way around it. This is, this is just sadness. And, and so what's going to happen in the short run? We're going to pay less for services. Maybe in the longer run, we're going to talk about buying a different set of services. Um, some people argue that, you know, all that debt stuff, that really isn't that big a deal because we can grow our way out of it. 
When I talk to my, uh, a bunch of, of friends who I think are sufficiently right-minded and, and have a sanguine view of the world and spend their life investing, they sit there and go, I don't see any way the next 20, year, 20 or 30 years are going to generate year-over-year -year economic growth that are going to allow us to grow our way out of this train wreck. Um, you know, we're, the 3 to 4% annual growth rates that we experienced in the 80s, 90s, and, and 2000s to me, are not something we're going to revisit anytime soon. And one could argue that that period of time really was artificially inflated because we were pulling back p future period consumption and consuming it then. Now we've got to pay our bills. So where do we go from here? And so uh, I like this quote from Alice Rivlin, long-run fiscal policy is health policy. Minor tweaks aren't going to solve the problem, and the time has passed for experimenting with idealistic concepts. Those are my words. That's what I, that's what I believe. These are the things we're talking about today. ACOs, bundled payment, value-based payment, and patient-centered medical home. Right? I mean, those are some of the hot button ones out there. Good stuff? Solving our problems? How many people? Which one of these do you guys like? Before I come strong with truth. <laughs> I think one of the questions is, the average American citizen, do they even know what any of these things are? I don't want them to know. I don't want them to know. I mean, do you guys remember kind of, uh, let's just talk about the healthcare fads over the last 20 years, 30 years. Patient folk, anybody remember patient focus reengineering? Yeah. I mean, okay, you know, I, I could just roll them off my tongue, right? I mean, it's just, stop. I mean, we have the GAO April 22nd calling out the, the test projects as costly waste. Um, I'll start showing you stuff from CBO reports on evaluation of all these demonstration projects to basically show you the waste. So, so this is the CBO coming out this spring looking at programs designed to kind of reduce hospital admissions and improve care coordination. Um, total of 34 programs. On net, they reduced hospital admissions uh, by 1%. But to, to, uh, they would need to generate a change in regular me Medicare spending needed to offset program fees of 11% to, to make that tie, to make that balance. Anyway, and regardless of how you look at it, whether it was the mode of interaction, this patient-centered medical home stuff, whether it was uh, care coordinator activity, you never got close to covering the initiative's costs. And, and all of this always on the front end is, Make an investment on the front end, and we'll save it to you on the back end, right? I mean, it's always, it's always on the come. And, and I care about the math problem, and that dog don't hunt. And it hasn't hunted for a long time. Value-based payment demonstrations from the CBO. Uh, the PGP, Premier Hospital Quality thing, Home Health Care Performance, the Heart Bypass thing. Here, here's the uh, pay for performance. Here's the bundled payment. What is the outcome, nature of incentives, effect on Medicare spending, little or none, none, little or none in the first year, okay? Um, bundled payments, they saw a 10% decline in spending on bypass surgery. Well, crap, man, we all know we ain't doing bypasses like we used to, right? We're stenting people. If I had looked at everybody outside of this, I would have generated that or more, right? So the, our demonstration projects, the evidence, the summarization of what we're seeing there is not generating the wins. How about pay for performance? Okay, March 29th uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the Premier Hospital Quality Initiative. 252 hospitals and Premier versus all the controls, 30-day mortality over a six-year period, found no evidence that the, that the largest hospital-based pay for performance program led to a decrease in 30-day mortality. So it cost us money and it didn't even generate any outcome change. Now here's a little exercise that I did. Um, where I said, and this is a paper I, I have under review right now, where I said, let's take the Medicare value-based payment formula and let's put it in place and let's see how ex hospital executives' compensation would change depending on how they scored. Okay, I just wanted to ask a simple question. Is it incentive compatible for hospital executives to even care? All right? So this is the total performance here. This is the process of care score. Here's, the, here's a bunch of the officer titles. And this is regressing the, uh, uh, the effect of the uh, kind of change, a 10% change on what happened to the executive's compensation. And the key thing you have to see here is just, well, one of these are significant, statistically significant, but they're also negative. So that if the 
executives actually did what Medicare wants them to do, their comp would go down under the current arrangements. Because all these guys are massively rewarded based on financial performance. And there's a cost to this. And that more than dominates the value that they would get from moving any of these quality metrics. Now, then this month we've got, this is from Health Affairs that just came out. Medicare's new hospital value-based purchasing program is likely to have only a small impact on hospital payments. And so this is just kind of reinforcing the other things that I'm saying. So the value-based kind of payment thing doesn't jazz me at all either. And the whole issue of the value-based payment and paying for quality really kind of freaks me out. All right? And it freaks me out because... I know how to play the game, and I can play it well. And the reality is, what we want is we want hospitals to do things to change workflow and processes to ensure better outcomes, whether it's hand washing, you name it. But that requires behavioral change on the part of people in the industry. And getting people to change behavior is hard. The easiest thing for me to do is game the system, right? I mean, that's easy. And I can game it readily. Um, and frequently, my concern is that the gaming activity associated with trying to drive these, uh, uh, drive these hospital quality metrics, the sequelae and consequences of the gaming is worse than if we never even looked. Let me give you an example. Patient safety indicators. You're all familiar with those, right? Love our PSIs. Uh, Post-op surgical site infection, ventilator-acquired pneumonia, all these wonderful things associated with antibiotics, right? We track these things, we report them, and they're part of our process of care measures. We'd like people to, to do things, to wash their hands and, and take uh, sterile precautions and whatnot. What's an easier way to address it? I'm a hospital. I can just blast them with broad spectrum antibiotics, right? Okay, I mean, I, I can just hit everybody with broad spectrum antibiotics, and then you're not going to get the infection. But what are you going to get as a result? ORSA, MRSA, vanco resistant ABC. So just because I'm a prick and I like doing things that make uh, curl people's toes, I have the Medicare 100% sample in my office. Okay? So I go and I look at the PSI scores for all U.S. hospitals, and then I go through the 14 million Medicare discharges, and then I come up with what is the vanco MRSA, ORSA, uh, infection rate in these facilities. And guess what? They're negatively correlated. If you have really nice PSI numbers, you have bad or some MRSA bad bug rates. Okay? Ooh, gosh, tell me, that, that feels hinky, doesn't it? It's easier to game the system. Furthermore, I can, just through artifacts of coding and severity adjustment, move any hospital's uh, uh, quality reports or any physician's quality reports around all over the place. Do it. I can do it. You hire my ass. Do it for you. Right? It's, it's ridiculous how, how sensitive these things are all to these ODE mortality, morbidity, infection rates are to the way we code, the way we severity adjust, and, and how manipulable they all are. So we are spending a whole bunch of resources on something here that is really difficult to measure. And then you know what? Do patients even care? Do they even know? No, because I, I will argue, you know, I have this, this challenge in dealing with providers because providers are sitting there saying, well, we, we care about our, our, our quality. And they're always talking about it in an inside baseball way, baseball way about um, their quality metrics, right? Their clinical quality metrics. But you talk to Joe Q. Public, and what is he going to talk about? Did the people smile? Could I park? Nurses happy? You know, that kind of stuff. And then the people in, in the facility get ticked that they don't appreciate the, all their quality scores. Well, there's this fundamental disconnect. You know why? Because Joe Q. Public thinks that hospitals are safe places with doctors who know what's going on, and they don't understand the fundamental danger and the train wrecks that happen in hospitals, and that hospitals are actually a leading cause of death in the United States. And so to first get Joe Q. Public to actually care about this, you have to first go out and inform Joe Q. Public that the U.S. hospital industry is kind of a dangerous place. 
and then they might care, but that's a really interesting marketing proposition. <laughs> right? So now we have ACOs. Um, Y'all excited about ACOs being the next savior? Is anybody here? Uh, do, okay, let me reverse it. Do y'all think ACOs are a problem? I mean, vo I get it. Volume-based reimbursement, the pay-per-click fee-for-service generates bad incentives. Yes. But ACOs, accountable care organizations, HMOs, integrated delivery systems of our last dance and go-around on this, they're all the same, same ilk. What are, the, are we applying the lessons we learned of our, our last time at this rodeo to our conversation about this again, or is this just a bunch of lemmings jumping off the cliff because they see it in the front of modern healthcare? Fundamentally, providers have no uh, ability to manage risk. All right. Furthermore, um, they have no ability to understand mean variance production propositions. And to be successful in an ACO world, you have to understand what your mean exposure is on a treatment protocol and or a population and be able to control the variance around. All statistical process control stuff. No organization in delivery is anywhere close to that. And we have no ability to vertically integrate uh, and actually create value as opposed to monopoly power, which Luke and I spent a lot of our time worrying about on the pricing side. Uh, January 24th, uh, we, got, we got two former CMS directors here, Don Berwick, who thinks that now the time is right for ACOs and they're, they're going to be a win, and, and then Tom Scully, the preceding CMS kind of head, um, saying that, you know, uh, ACOs, remain, the incentive for ACO participants remain very small, that's what makes the startup cost real, um, instead suggests ACOs are driving more power to hospitals, not to doctors, um, and, then, and then my point, since I'm not a CMS kind of guy, director, um, I think if they actually did anything, people would be pissed. And they wouldn't like them, right? For the same reason they didn't like HMOs. And there's going to be a ton of pushback in, in this space. And if you've noticed, all of our discussion around initiatives in the healthcare industry and things that are going to, our little trials, are all around the supply side. No, l stop. Let's work on the demand side. Let's work on the demand side for a minute. Let's change the demand side. And that, to me, if, you wanna, if I want to solve our math problem credibly, if I can shut off demand, that is a place that's going to be much more reliable to me than relying on providers to ration and or change their mode of treatment. And we, don't, we, we have not wanted to engage in that conversation. A, a, a final kind of piece of evidence um, that I want to go through is, is bigger better. So when I, going back 40 years ago, my pediatrician I remember going to was, had one nurse and it was him, okay? And it was in like a shopping mall or something, or some shopping mall building, right? Um, we were a cottage industry of providers. And we've moved to the corp through the corporatization of the practice of medicine to the idea that we've got to be big. We've got to have big multi-specialty groups. We've got to have big groups because they have to be able to engage in the IT infrastructure investments and blah, 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 blah. And there are somehow there are economies of scale here that are exploited by being in these groups. Um, so I grabbed this uh, most recent and the biggest study I could find, looking at MGMA practice cost survey data, 3,800 practices, 70,000 physicians, and, and here's just some attributes of, of them. That's not important. Uh, here's the point, is let's look at if larger practices are technically more efficient in the production of medical care, okay? Do they, are there economies of scale? And I've highlighted this line here. If there are returns to scale, this number, should be greater than one and hopefully a lot bigger than one. And here you have family practice peds, cardiology, orthopedic surgery, OBGYN, urology. This is from a production function estimate. And what you see here is that are there big returns to scale? Well, if there are any, they're tiny. Sometimes they're not even there. And then if you slice it this way by practice ownership, you know, not really even there. And in physician-owned um, uh, group practices, 
the bigger you get, the less productive you are. If it's less than one, the bigger you are, the less productive you get. And the author's conclusion here is, while our analysis described differences among practice types, we found few instances of advantages to practice size, even for multi-specialty practice. In fact, the more homogeneous practice types showed decreasing or constant return scale. That is, there's no technical advantage to size or growth for most practice types. Yeah, I mean, so when I, when I talk to groups, physician groups, and they're talking about, oh, we've got to be getting big groups to amass market power. One, I say, I hate you. You're, a, you're an awful person, and your mother must have dropped you on your head. Because w that is really what that's doing is saying, I need to be paid more, which means all of us as uh, residents of that locale is basically a wealth transfer, right? Right. So, no, it, it's probably evil. I mean, they're probably not wired, right? Um, but I don't think it's a sustainable reason to be, to invest in the infrastructure to get big because cuts are coming. And at the end of the day, the, okay. No, this is just on the production side. This is not on the pricing side, okay? So this is, a, what I care about is the technical, pro technical production of efficient healthcare delivery. Do, does being big make you more efficient? No. It, there, there could be a market power impact, but, but those are things that I, in kind of a social welfare sense, want to eschew, if I can. Um, let's talk about hospital uh, cost and productivity for a minute. And this is where I, I think we need to be living. So. I would like our hospitals to be well-run, efficient, mean, lean organizations just focused on pr value, pr uh, value production, right? Um, it's the right thing for our communities. And if we can deliver the greatest uh, amount of output per unit of input, man, that's, uh, that would be a good thing for our constituents. And furthermore, regardless of however healthcare reform and everything else shakes out, if you're a mean, lean fighting machine and you're efficient, well, that should be a good, that should, should position you well. So I went, uh, do any of you guys play with the uh, HICRIS data, Medicare cost reports, Form 252996? Just once a year. Just once a year? <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I, these are fun for me because I'm not sufficiently well-rounded. Um, and, and so I play with these things a lot, right? And, and, and so I've got the entire history of all the Medicare cost reports and analytic files on my machine. And so I use them to kind of tell stories. And, and so I uh, said, is there a relationship between profitability of a hospital and efficiency in production of output? Okay, and so that, that's what I wanted to estimate here. And so that's what I did. I went to the uh, 2009 Medicare cost reports and went through this little exercise on all U.S. hospitals. And I estimated a multi-output uh, multi production function where they produce, you know, inpatient days, uh, ER visits, outpatient surgery, inpatient surgery, let this, a lot of technical whiz-bangery that's really kind of boring. But I went and, and, and so I came up with kind of an estimate and a score for every hospital. And I just, I couldn't find the slide I wanted, but this one kind of will make my point. Um, this is size of hospital on the, on, the, on the vertical axis. This is return on assets from operations. Uh, on the horizontal axis from minus three to, uh, to plus three. And I, my green dots, there's a lot of green dots here because I've got about 5,000 hospitals and they're all overlaying each other, which is my graphing problem. Um, <coughs> but I colored dark red dots as bad guys who were really high cost for the amount of output they should have produced on a case mix adjusted basis. And then I had dark green dots that are the really good guys who had low costs for how much inputs they, pr uh, how much output they produce given their inputs, and then kind of color gradations in the middle. And what I would have hoped in my naive, kind of idealized, utopian world is that all the red guys would be over here, and all the green guys would be over here, and I'd see a red to green movement. And I'm nowhere close to anything like that, which says that being efficient and being technically and productively efficient does not translate into higher operating margins. You don't win by being efficient. That's actually a population bias because we think that most hospitals in the US are not for profit and they control the bottom line by salary. Right. So there's this demand for the bottom line, but not really speaking to be on the right side of the curve. 
Well, so uh, now I'm gonna uh, now I'm gonna unwind the story for you a little bit. I'm gonna set up a straw man. Then I'm gonna pull out my torch and light him on fire, and then we'll all take a deep sigh and smile. When you do that, though, will you talk about the for-profit, not for-profit? Yeah. Feels very different to me as well. Yeah. No. I listen. Um, I love for profits. Okay. Well, they're doing well. Th they are doing well, and 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 I think the for profits have a, a lot of leg room on a go forward basis, for the following reason. Um, it's, let me just tell the story. So little relationship between efficient hospital and profitable ones. Why? And I've tried this out, and I've gone around. I, I did a thing talking to, to 350 hospital CFOs once, and I tried this out, and they go, "Oh yeah, that's what we do." So here's what happens is that our contracting director, and we have a wonderful one here at Vanderbilt. Love her, Bev Kosha. And so she go, they go and they sit down across the table from Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or whomever, and they pull out their club and they beat the bejesus out of them, right? To extract these nice rates. And then they bring them back to the organization and then they light them on fire and just burn them up. And we expand our cost structure to consume anything that we can get at the negotiation table. In part, as a, as a, as a function of the not-for-profit organizational form, we have a non-distribution constraint. Um, it could, and it's also just probably just bad management. They could be, there's no reason why a not-for-profit has to become inefficient if they get a lot of money. They could deliver a lot more care. But that's a lot more work than becoming inefficient. And so they choose inefficiency, and that's bad. Um, and so we've got a delivery system, hospitals, which are 30, 35 percent of our spend, that most of them have tremendous market power, and they are able to use that to extract rates and elevate their cost structures in such a way to generate a 3 percent operating margin by being inefficient. During the health care reform debate, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama was held up as an awful, rotten organization, right? Because they are a monopolist. They have 95% of the commercially insured market in the state of Alabama. And we need more competition in insurance markets to stop those rotten Blue Cross Blue Shields of Alabama, right? I mean, do you remember this kind of conversation a little bit? Does that make sense to you? If I am living in Alabama as a subscriber of Alabama Blue Cross Blue Shield, I want them to have lots of market power to go and beat up on the provider. If I subset that and I look for efficient hospitals, you know where efficient hospitals are located? Alabama. I'll pull out Huntsville Hospital in Huntsville, Alabama, roughly the same size as us here at Vanderbilt. If they got paid Medicare rates across the board, Medicare is one of their best payers, they would be rolling in money. They wouldn't know what to do with themselves because they've been beaten down for so long by the commercial payers that they've had to come up with ways of delivering care in a much more efficient way. You can't find a hospital here in Middle Tennessee that could live on Medicare rates. Um, so one is that I don't believe in quality. <laughs> C.1, the disclaimer early on, right? Because I, I, really, I really don't know what it means. I don't know, I don't know how you can give me a number. You know, you see, right? well, like porn? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Um, but, I, but I don't go searching out porn. Uh, so I don't know how to come up with a sensible way of framing the quality conversation to understand the nature of the trade-off. If I wanted to generate good quality outcomes, to me, one of the easiest ways to do it is stop doing stuff to people, is to take that side down, which helps my math problem on the front end. Um, but the, this technical cost side is hugely problematic for us. And if there's one area that we need to be hammering on, in my opinion, is it's driving efficient lean production. Um, and so kind of what do I see going forward? Uh, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, we need to pull back on the demand side. 
I mean, everything we've been talking about is a supply side issue, supply side innovation, in either in reimbursement and structure or whatnot. But if you still got everybody in the United States wanting and going forward and trying to demand unlimited amounts of health care, this is going to be a huge point of contention and dissatisfaction. And so I want to limit the demand side, all right? Um, we need to massively increase the productivity of delivery system. And to me, the forcing mechanism there is to take money off the table. The more money we take off the table, the more they're going to have the come to Jesus moment that they've got to do business differently. And this is here is this individual accountability is related back to the demand side, is that in equilibrium, our future health benefits will not look anything like what we have today. And that will go a long way towards solving our problems. We must ration health care. So Don Berwick, who was run out of CMS because he was a, a, a kind of an off-season appointment, good guy, um, and Henry Aaron, nominated head of Social Security, both say, you know, you got, you can, thinking that you can get home by eliminating waste, so, uh, 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 uh. we got to, at the end of the day, we have an unlimited ability to do stuff to people in the healthcare industry. Every, everybody here could be made, Im they could be improved. <laughs> by consuming a little bit more health care, right? And we'll figure out a way to inform you of that and do it to you. So, a uh, short term, we're going we're gonna to have to raise the debt ceiling again somewhere between September 30th and year end because, well, we have no appetite to do anything else. And in reality, we're so far off any trajectory that's sensible. There's nothing else we can do other than just keep borrowing for the near term. Um, and, you know, Jim would best address the SGR. We're going to have to punt on that, too. And that's a, what, four, seven trillion dollar fix right there, just an accounting sleight of hand, because the seniors would go absolutely nuts if, uh, if we whacked uh, physician re re reimbursement by 30-something percent, physicians departicipated out of Medicare. You know, you'd see this huge uprise. Um, and then we enter the new year with a structural contraction in the economy. I hope. Now, where do we go in the in medium term? Well, we're going to see this continual shift towards consumer-directed high-deductible plans. And I like that, because that just makes sense. And it's economically sustainable in the long run. Um, and, and at the end of the day, all this ticky-tack little stuff of physician office visits, all these things, will go away. They'll be part of a health savings account, fine, and you'll have the true catastrophic plan that is the only thing that we should all have. Um, we're going to see hospital top level re uh, revenue declining. Um, we've done some modeling. If the exchange comes into play and exists, most people are going to go for uh, kind of the bronze plan, likely, because of the premium cost, and it's going to have high patient cost sharing. Now, here is the real big problem that the hospital industry, including my employer, did not appreciate and understand when they supported the health care reform legislation. And that is, just because somebody has insurance doesn't mean they're going to pay their co-pays and uh, co-insurance and deductibles. All right? The reality is that... Over time, as, as CDHP, as health savings account grow, and people have more and more cost sharing, co-pay, co-insurance out of pocket, as a share of our revenue in hospitals, we are going to have to get more money from patients directly. Okay? That's good. And you know what? Now we have an entire generation who is wired. Says, I don't have to pay that. Right? I think here, I think here at Vanderbilt, around a third of our bad debt could be due to people who have insurance. We can't collect on the co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance. And that number is going to go up. All right? Um, my hope is, at the same time, we're going to see this result in a contraction in demand. The easiest way to solve the math problem is that people don't come and ask for stuff, like Jim was alluding to. Mom walking in wanting antibiotics for a viral ear infection. And if she had to pay $100 at the, at the door, she might not come in. Now, roll out four to 10 years, um, I think we're going to have to finally come to terms with the fact that our health care delivery system cares more about the health of Americans than the Americans do themselves. And I, I really do think that. Um, I think our medical community, our medical establishment wants people to consume things that they, that they place a much higher value on than the individual does. 
And you can say they're ignorant. You can say they have inappropriate discounting of the future, all those things. That's fine. But, you know, if I take a typical commercially insured population right now, and I got lots of claim data from lots of insurers, and I look at the, uh, the compliance rate with chronic use medications in a commercial population, what do you think it is? Huh? Yeah, 15, 30 percent. It's people don't even take the drugs they have in their that they're supposed to be taking for chronic purposes in their medicine cabinets. People don't value the services the way the providers want them to value them. Maybe once we get have the come to Jesus moment, we individually underwrite people, charge them by the pound. We're going to have some people who start caring again. Uh, there was a comment earlier today about kind of defined contribution for defined benefit. Right now, we are in the midst of a shift that we went through with respect to uh, pensions 40-something years ago. And we saw the great unwinding of the defined benefit pension to a defined contribution by employers. And if we can do it for retirement, we can sure as hell do it for health care as well. And so the future is going to be one of employers will make defined contributions and they'll get out of the health benefit business entirely. And that, that, that is, that's where the world will unwind to. Um, uh, I think, re yeah. Where will that go? To like a health savings account or something along those lines? We'll, we'll, cre kind of we'll create 401ks. We'll call them 401Hs. Yeah, something like that, right? Um, and, and we'll have the money there that you can use. And furthermore, I would expect that would generate a whole new industry, a good industry. I mean, back when we had pensions, we didn't have Morningstar. We didn't have Vanguard, T. Rowe, Price, Fidelity. We didn't have people who were sitting there trying to help you maximize the value from your retirement dollar. Similarly, we could have a whole new industry come up, and this is probably where health plans will come in, evolve and play, where they are in a position to help you make good investment decisions about your health care dollar to maximize your health. And through, through their picking and identification of higher quality providers, and they'll compete on that. Just to make something like that work, wouldn't, don't we have to kind of fundamentally like reprice the costs of all the health care offerings in the entire world because it seems to me that the prices that the insurance companies pay to the hospitals are based on this kind of gluttonous pie that's been created out there. Yeah. So to go to that, yes. the people in this room are going to have to real have to live with a lot less revenue. Right. A lot less revenue. Oh, yeah. Totally. Like their business may not exist anymore. That would not be a bad You'd thing. Like yeah. I'd like that. Yeah. That's not, I, dude, write a book. Uh, yeah. I mean... The thing is, is that when we move to a defined contribution, I'm going to start caring, right? And there's going to be this great one. Unfortunately, we got ICD-10 coming, right? Oh, my God. That allows me so much freedom to play so many more games. Holy cow. All we do is keep getting things more and more complex, more and more micro, more and more specific to the point that I will be able to manipulate and play games around anything you put in place whether it's severity adjusting populations or whatnot, I mean, how does Medicare Advantage do it? Medicare Advantage plans play the game. I, I enroll a senior, and then I diagnose the bejesus out of them, code them, set my base high, and then I get savings. It's, I could do it all through coding, right? Is this, does this resonate at all? So we got to step back from the complexity of allowing us to get so mechanical with this because there's a lot of creative people out there who will make a lot of money doing the wrong thing. <laughs> if, right? If. It, it, the other thing is that your adult children are going to move back with you. All right? Thanks. Because, yeah, because we're unwinding. Huh? Yeah. Well, you're going to need them to move back with you because of this slide here. Yes, because your children are going to have to care for you in your old age. That's how it should be. Listen, that's why I knew I needed two daughters. I needed one and I needed a spare. 
in case I piss one off. And I've been socializing them from the get-go into the uh, mindset that they are there to take. You're never leaving Daddy, right? No, Daddy. We're, I'm going to build you a house over on that hill on the farm. Yeah, Daddy, we're never leaving you. And because and th this is where we're going to have to be. We're going to have to reframe ourselves to a world of 40 years ago in terms of kind of the network of how we support one another. Um, I think the end game equilibrium is that we're going to look very much like most other countries in the world. We're going to have a public safety net, government insurer with a covered and limited scope of services that can, can be supplied with available tax funding. And you know what? That will not look anything like Medicare or Medicaid. Correct. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, I, I like to use my mom as an example here because she had a knee replaced, paid for by Medicare. All right? Um, and, and I wrote a, a, a blog post on Forbes about her knee replacement where I likened her, uh, her new knee as c uh, to conspicuous consumption, not any, in any way, shape, or form un dissimilar from a new big flat panel TV, except for in one case, she's buying it, and in the other case, her ch grandchildren are going to pay for it. And she did not appreciate that at all. <laughs> um, the math of it is, is, is take uh, major joint hips, knees. MSDRG, what is it, 460, somewhere around there? You know how many Medicare pays for per year? 460,000, okay? So that's 460,000 knees um, that Medicare pays for a year. And w w what's, a, what's an average reimbursed Medicare amount? Obviously, it's going to vary by every facility, but what, a, 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 let's say a 25K number? Is that good? If I throw in physician services, what? Well, for knees, that's, that's probably still a little high. Physician gets around five grand right now. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking just a uh, hospital. I'm, I want to go all in on it. What Medicare is paying? Uh, physician, anesthesia, everybody else. Okay, so look it. <laughs> right here, I'm at I'm at like uh, nine point five. Help me with my math, guys. I mean, at twenty five thousand. Huh? I've got. I, this is the way I want to frame it. Do it this way. Okay. So to, to, to pay for a knee, um, I have to get money out of a taxpayer today, right? A median taxpayer today pays 1.45% matched by their employer of their, of their income. And the median Americans are around a $35,000 a year person. And so here I need about 19 taxpayers, entire Medicare payroll deductions for one year to pay for one knee. And then I got to multiply that by 460 thousand knees. Okay? So I get quickly up to somewhere around nine million taxpayers just to pay for knees. Now how many taxpayers do I have? It was on that slide at the beginning. I have 118 million taxpayers. Just on knees, I just used up nine million of them. All right? And why? So that my mom can get some little bit better rotation here as she comes through. I don't begrudge her having a new knee for a moment. But that, the fact that the government doesn't pay for it doesn't mean she can't have it. Pay for it with your own money. So we are going to have to have a come to Jesus moment around defining what it's the set of services that are part of this standard benefit plan. And it's not going to look anything like what we have now. And this is where civil unrest ensues. <laughs> Because people are going to get pissed. They are. Um, and we've just expanded the entitlement to a broader set of people. And, what they're gonna, and when you start taking it away from them and say, sorry, can't do needs, can't do, can't do organ transplants, can't do the, People are going to get upset. And I'll be glad I live in the country. Um, and then, so delivery system is going to reorganize around public and private providers. Because I don't believe in equilibrium that you can supply... The, the, the same trajectory of care and, and uh, uh, differentiated care through the same production system and expect the providers to differentiate how they treat a patient on an insurer-by-insurer, payer-by-payer basis. 
right? Which is one of the reasons why I don't know how the ACO thing is ever going to work because I don't think our providers in our delivery systems are going to sufficiently differentiate how they use inputs to the care of those patients so that they are giving lots of things to people with fee-for-service and making money there and not delivering as much resource intensity over here. And how you get the transition through that, I don't know how you get home. Um, and so your children are going to care for you in old age is, is kind of the, the end point here. So uh, kind of where, where do I end up? I, you know, I really want us to pull back on the demand side, um, then rely on the supply side to ration. And we need to take the dollars out of the delivery system to force the issue. Um, I'm a big fan of us developing capacity to measure and monitor, particularly in real time variation within a facility. It, that, that, I mean, that's core to me being able to get a handle on my production efficiency so that I can evaluate whether I'm out of tolerance bounds. I believe that on a go forward basis, this area here that we're not nearly focused on enough, in my opinion, in, the, in, uh, in terms of quality is going to be more important. That's the service side. Because, you know, I go to a doctor now and I spend 20 bucks out of pocket on copay. And I have a rule that if I wait more than 45 minutes, I walk out. All right? And, but I'm, that's my hurdle rate with 20 bucks. And I'm really kind of, you know, my blood pressure is high. My blood pressure is always high because the time I get to see you, doctor, I've been stewing for 45 freaking minutes, right? <laughs> I got one, buddy. You, 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 you can tell. Uh, and so, so, but now if I'm having to pay $267, huh, I'm going to have a very different expectation about what that experience is I'm going to get. And those co-pays and those out-of-pocket costs have got to go up, and that's going to change the, the expectations. Huh? I'll, I'll care about service quality. Service. Yeah. Because it's the only thing I can understand. I mean, I'm not going to know whether the surgeon made the right technical approach through the, through the back of the knee where they use the right screws. I, I, I'm never going to know that. But I'm going to readily know, could I get in? Was it easy? Did people smile? Was it a positive experience? Those things are going to be important. We're going to get, we're gonna have to get money from our patients directly. And, and we're going to have to change. And, and hopefully, this is going to force some magnitude of uh, order, order of improvement in the way we go about delivering care because we, we need a factor of uh, uh, an order of magnitude improvement in our productivity proposition. So I've already gone a little long. Um, three minutes over. We got time for a question or two, John? Oh, absolutely. Anything you guys want to say? Does, it, does this resonate with you at all? Yeah. Huh? Is what state or federal? Can you change it to a state-driven system and get the feds out of it? Well, so the interesting thing about that is, is if it's a state system, then what's every, what's every state going to do? They're going to compete to hopefully get people to move somewhere else. Right? <laughs> or at least move to the border so they, they can go across the state. Yeah, I mean, so I moved it down here. I was in upstate New York before I moved down here. New York State's screwed, man. They've got no hope. People are leaving the state in boats, and the taxes that the residents have to pay there are so ungodly that they're, never going to, they're, going to, they're not able to support the social infrastructure and the, and the Medicaid program. The state of New York, in 2010, Medicaid budget, $50 billion. 2012, $62 billion. Two years. <laughs> when it went up that much. Um, so at a state level, I think it's an interesting proposition because I like the idea of competition among states and, and kind of states having decision rights on it. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of like the block grant idea. Give the money to states and let them kind of customize things to meet their own populations. For everybody or just the, what we call the Medicaid thing? Well, to me, in the, in the equilibrium world order, we're not going to have Medicare, we're not going to have Medicaid, we're going to have some social safety net that is just their period, and, and, and that would be this catch-all. And, you know, just uh, an off point. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit kind of conservative right of center, and, and so I want markets to be my allocation mechanism because they're efficient. I think mar markets allocate resources for the most highly valued use. Can I use markets in healthcare to be that vehicle? Ugh. The problem I have with that is that for, for markets to work, there have to be winners and losers, and you have to pay the price for not making good decisions in markets. Now, the implication for, for healthcare with that is that if you make a bad decision in a healthcare marketplace, that is, you didn't buy insurance, you didn't get coverage, you didn't do these things, 
the physician, the provider would have to be the disciplining mechanism to withhold care from you at the point where it could save your life. And I just think that's inhuman for the provider. I don't care about the individual, to be honest with you. It's, it's to me about the providers. And I can't put my providers in a position where they are the policemen here and are going to have to do something that's antithetical and against what they were trained to do. So to me, that, that basically defines your safety net, John, is that if, if it's life-saving, I don't care what card you got, you, are, you got a heartbeat, respirations, and we're going to take action to make sure that that little thing, we're, we will, our, every provider will always do, and that will be a part of the safety net. But man, you know, so much of healthcare doesn't fall into that category. It seems like the, the product, going back to the comment about the uh, self-funded account, the, the, the whole problem, in my view, or one of the problems is, is that we really don't have health insurance. It's just a means of finance. We have prepaid healthcare consumption. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, right. Well, we have, we, have, we have tremendous excess consumption. And the only way, I mean, Vanderbilt University involuntarily takes from me my income and converts it into prepaid health care consumption that I can only get back by going out and consuming health care. That's what they do. <laughs> it makes me angry. Lots of things make me angry. Um, and what I want is they sit there and say, you, you're, and they give me a statement saying they're spending $12,000 a year on my behalf for my health plan. I was like, you, you think that makes me feel good? No, give me the $12,000 in cash. And let me go out and buy a catastrophic plan on e, ehealthinsurance.com for $3,600 for my family and be better off to the tune of the $9,000. The problem is that in our current world order, as Jim alluded to this morning, very rightly, is that the tax deductibility of employer-sponsored health insurance creates an incentive to put everything in a health benefit, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's, a, it's a tax preferred way of compensating me. And it's completely bad. Every economist worth their salt would argue that that is the single biggest perturbation as part of the U.S. healthcare system is the tax deductibility of employer-sponsored health insurance. It's ruined everything. And, you know, in, in the 2008 presidential election, John McCain I, I helped out on the John McCain policy team, and he ran on the point of, of changing that, eliminating the tax deductibility. And he was hoisted on the petard by Obama for that. Yeah, there was, uh, you had a comment? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, so, that's so important, but it, it kind of gets back to that. I mean, the government created this problem. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so here's the question: Is that I, I'm frustrated by the fact that I travel around, and talk to a lot of hospitals. I talk to hospitals here, there, and the other thing, and they want to buy something. They want a. They think they want to get this answer. They want this from you all, and they don't. Shouldn't really want that. They should want something else. I know, I know. They, they hire you for patient-centered medical. Do, do you guys like patient-centered medical home? Is that the next answer? Because there's lots of research out there that says this is awesome, and every single piece of it is done by the patient-centered medical home lobbying and advocacy groups and primary care docs. Okay, I love it. I like ACOs because I'm building well ACOs. <laughs> there you go. I understand. <laughs> All right, so wait, wait, Larry. Yeah. Very compelling data, argument, the whole thing, yeah. vision. No roadmap to get there. Huh? No, so what, it's, what it will take to get there is a great ungluing. I mean, we need to, w there needs to be. guys are going to do the ungluing. No, no, no. <laughs> right. What we're going to need is we're going to need a fiscal crisis, a black swan event, that is going to force people to become realistic about this. Now, um, <coughs> Governor Bredesen is working on his next book. He wrote a book a couple of years ago called Fresh Medicine 
that I helped him out with a little bit. And he's working on his next book. And he came by about a month and a half ago and sat down with a number of us on the faculty here at Owen to discuss exactly that issue. What is going to be the thing that's going to drive this off the cliff that we're going to then have the freedom to engage in conversation that right now would be political suicide? And now, so we're clearly not in the world of health economists, now we're in the macro world, and so I had one of my colleagues, Dave Parsley, come in and be part of this conversation. And his assessment was, is when uh, China unpegs their exchange rate, that is going to be the key issue, because that will change worldwide monetary investment flows. R the U.S. will no longer be the haven where everybody will go. Interest rates then will go like crazy, and that will change the game. Soon. Hopefully so. <laughs> listen, listen, we're living, we're living in fantasy land. What, what is the Dow right now? The, the, Dow, the Dow is at 13,200. You've got to be kidding me. That's nuts. I mean, the discount of net present value of the future stream, when we've got a liability on the country, why that's bigger than our country's assets, that Dow should be low. That, to me, that's just common sense. But I mean, do, you, do you see the unpegging as a peaceful transition for the world? No, I don't see any of this as being peaceful. That's not a real peaceful. Well, the consulting terms is you need a firm platform. Correct. To make change. What you're saying right. is this burning platform is coming, and this is what's going this, to This could be one of those, those burning moments. We need, we need some, I, I'm totally with you, we need some burning platform. We know as consultants that very rarely can we affect major change without Right. If things are kind of okay, a little mediocre, and we right. just get through it, we are about as ineffectual as we can be because right. there's not a lot of change we're going to be able to do. I, I agree, but unfortunately, it's not. Bonuses aren't at stake here, John. Lots are at stake. Oh, absolutely. Lots. Unfortunately, the history of the world, uh, hopefully, a lot of lives won't be lost. But unfortunately, major changes in the world order have involved loss. I'm not saying that that's good, but that, that is. People are going to have to care, just like you're, you're being my down yeah. because your wife keeps you out of your bedroom. Right. And you wanted her back. And that's what I, I, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's true. Right. Because I didn't even have a pediatrician when I was a child. Right. I got my shots at the school. Yeah, me too. And Remember that? You get the little marks on your arms? I got a couple, couple of times I had stitches, but we had a family practitioner that was a one doc office, and his wife was his secretary. Right. We and my parents paid out of pocket. Yeah. We, we don't need a patient centered medical home with a nutritionist and a lifestyle counselor and, and all this infrastructure in play to support something that people don't fundamentally take responsibility for and value right now. Right. That's right. The real, the real problem is, is, is we can't really do that without a major catastrophe. Right. So, so, you know, I am a doom and gloom guy, and I'm hoping for that major catastrophe. I'm like looking for it and going, wow, it's the Mayan calendar, 2012, December 21st. Is it tax again? What is going to generate? Boom. You know? Because that's, that's what we need. All right, folks, thank you very much.